Welcome to Heath Farm in Northwest Norfolk. I'm Matt England, the Estate Manager at Fring Estate, and I'll be talking to you about how we've adapted living mulches to work within our farming system, and then taking you through some of the key points in the Agroecology Guide. Living mulches are semi-permanent legume understories that have cereal crops drilled in them. They provide ground cover, combining cover cropping and mulching to cut inputs and support soil health, though they do need careful management. In this how-to video, I'll take you through all the different stages, the wins, the setbacks, and the things I wish I'd known before I set out. Think of this as a framework you can adapt to your own system. Living mulches come with a range of benefits, including fixing atmospheric nitrogen to support the following crop, and studies have shown improvements in chemical, physical, and biological soil health. We've got a mixed system here, cereals, linseed, legume bicrops, and livestock. All that diversity is exactly why living mulches caught my attention. The living mulch system runs over three years and includes seven stages. It works alongside the rotation to build soil health and keep things in balance. Here's how it works. Spring is when it all kicks off. This is the first stage of your living mulch system. We're aiming to under sow a clover mix into a spring cereal. Choosing the right species is one of the most critical decisions in the process. Getting it right now sets the tone for the whole system. Choosing an overly vigorous species will lead to the mulch outcompeting the cash crop in the second year, leading to significant yield penalties. White clover is a common choice, but it can create a yield penalty in year two. Lucerne's interesting, their deep roots are brilliant, but it's too vigorous for organic systems. Over the last couple of years, I've been using Jura, a small leaf white clover, it's worked fairly well for us and I sow it at five kilos a hectare. This year I'm trialling yellow trefoil. It has a different rooting structure from clover, so hopefully won't be as competitive with the cash crop. I'm trialling it on its own, but you can try it in a mix up to 40% with white clover. For under sowing, I use a set of Opco harrows with a cedar box. Now timing is crucial for this process, you want to establish your living mulch during your last harrow pass, which is normally around the end of April, and ideally before rain. This will kill some weeds and also create a nice tilth, which helps you establish your mulch. Clover seeds are tiny, which is why we broadcast them on the surface. A quick roll afterwards helps lock in moisture if it's dry. As we move through the summer of year one, our main focus is on the cash crop. During this establishment phase, our spring cereal is developing nicely with the living mulch growing underneath. The beauty of this system is how little management it takes. Once you've undersown the living mulch, we simply watch and wait. Weather becomes the biggest factor. Severe drought can significantly impact mulch survival. Establishment at this phase depends largely on rainfall, which is out of your hands. If it's wet during the early summer, the mulch can create a green mat across the field, which, if it grows up into the crop, can cause problems. After harvest, the clover explodes into life, and it's at this point we want to top it so we can control some weeds, but also get a nice even canopy across the whole field. By the end of year one, we're aiming for a well-established living mulch with good ground cover, setting us up perfectly for the next crop. Get this right and you're halfway there. Now comes the tricky part, establishing a cereal into your living mulch. Year two is what I call the true living mulch year, and this is where your management decisions are critical to success. I went for winter oats this year. However, now I'm growing rye, it's clear that their early vigor and drought tolerance would be far more suitable to a living mulch system. Before drilling, you need to manage your mulch height. We've tried two different methods, both grazing with sheep and mowing the mulch back hard. Both methods are effective for removing biomass and helping you establish your cereal crop. Timing of drilling is key. You want to be aiming to drill the cereal just as your clover goes into dormancy at around 10 degrees soil temperature. That way it gives the cereal a chance to establish really well in the spring before the clover really gets moving. 
Ideally, you'd use a proper direct drill for this, which our Horsch Pronto isn't. However, so long as we roll afterwards and get enough pressure on the coulters, it does seem to work. Drilling earlier may require additional water management. And it's also worth noting that living mulches can harbour slug populations, which can be a problem on heavier soils than ours. Another critical consideration is seeding rates. This year, in our living mulch trial, we doubled seeding rates. because I noticed that in the living mulch, the oats only have one tiller, whereas in the ploughed and drilled field, you have up to three or even four or five tillers. The goal in this autumn period is to get your cereal crop established before winter really sets in, giving it the best possible start in its competition against the mulch. Getting these decisions right, crop selection, mulch management, timing and seeding rates will determine your success in the true living mulch year. During the winter months, we need to carefully monitor our living mulch to make sure it doesn't outcompete with our cash crop when spring growth really kicks in. In winter, the clover typically enters a period of dormancy, which gives our cereal crop a chance to establish without any significant competition. Winter management of your mulch can take different forms. Sheep grazing or flailing can both be effective to reduce the competitiveness of the mulch. This needs to be done to allow your cereal to grow away in the spring. Again, timing is key. Any grazing or mowing must be completed before stem extension of your cereal crop, which is typically around mid-March, depending on your location. Our main focus is to make sure the cereal gets away from the living mulch as early as possible. I've found an application of Digestate in early February gives the cereal the boost it needs to grow away from the clover. By late March, both the clover living mulch and the cereal, in this case oats, are growing really well together. It looks great, but it does create its own challenges, and this is where you see if your planning really pays off. One major benefit we've seen is weed suppression. The living mulch effectively keeps annual weeds at bay, which is key in our organic rotation. Perennial weeds like thistles and docks can still be an issue though. They start growing in March, so having good ground cover by then is key. This is where you need to plan how many years you want to have your living mulch down for. Harvesting year two presents some real challenges. By this stage, the clover is well established and much more vigorous than it was in year one. This can risk lots more green matter in your straw at harvest. Yield penalties remain the main risk with living mulches. Last year, we saw a 21% yield drop, despite it being a wet year that should have suited the oats. But this was partly offset by 50 pounds a hectare saved from not ploughing. After harvest, your mulch bounces back remarkably quickly creating immediate grazing opportunities if sheep are available. But if that's not an option, then flailing after harvest will help you manage any established weeds. After harvesting the year two, you have several options, depending on how you've integrated the mulch into your rotation. You can either direct drill a cereal crop straight into this mulch, or if your perennial weed burden or volunteer burden is too high, you can bring it into a herbal lay or plough it up and start again. Some farmers transition the mulch into a lay for grazing and fertility building. This is done by stitching in vigorous grasses and herbs into the living mulch itself. I brought pigs into the rotation at this stage as the weed burden was too high. The pigs will turn the mulch over, add back more fertility, and then this will go back into cropping in 12 months time. Living mulches aren't without their challenges, but I think they've got real potential. If you want to try this on your own farm, then learn from other people's mistakes. We've found that cereal selection, seed rate, and then the establishment of that cereal is key. And then for us on this farm, getting the fertility right in the spring is also fundamental to making this work. If you can get all of those things right, it gives this crop the best opportunity to outcompete the living mulch. If we can make this work without a yield penalty, it then makes it viable to build into a whole farm systems approach. Consider how a practice like living mulches fits onto your farm and review the benefits it can bring across your rotation and not just in a single year. 
Good luck with your living mulch journey. And if you want to learn more, check out the Agricology website for more resources.